Hey guys, so we're going to pick up where we left off yesterday, um, talking about non-placental mammals, and today we are going to pick up with placental mammals. So let's get started. Um, so the difference between a placental and a non-placental mammal is that placental mammals carry the developing baby inside the mother's body. Okay, so your non-placental mammals gave birth to an egg or an extremely underdeveloped baby. Um, the placental mammals are going to continue to keep that baby on the inside until it is relatively fully formed, okay? Um, now, obviously, that's not the case with every one of them. Uh, you know, human babies, you got to take care of them for quite a while. But uh, if you think about, like, a cow or a horse, like, those babies, you know, they just pop out and they run away. So, um, for the most part, it is a fully formed baby, at least, you know, like, organ-wise, it's fully formed. Okay, now the name placental and non-placental is referring to the placenta, which maybe we talked about in the, um, like the organ unit where we talked about the reproductive system. Basically the placenta is the thing that connects the mom to the baby. So it is, you know, your umbilical cord, uh, the way that the mom gives energy to the baby. So that's the placenta. Okay, so. Um, I want to talk about the different kinds of placental mammals because they're super cool. So, um, we're just going to be real brief because boy oh boy I could spend hours talking about this. So, um, our first group of placental mammals is the Afrotheria. Um, these guys are in the same group, so it's these two animals here. Um, so it's the elephant and then this guy right here, which is called a rock hyrax. Um, and this seems kind of crazy, but if you take an elephant, you shrink it down to, you know, roughly football sized and you give it fur and you take away its nose, it's gonna be looking like this, okay? So they are very similar, they just adapted to do different things. Um, and we'll talk more about that in another video. I'll, you know, we'll touch on it. So um, these guys are in the same group because um, they have internal testicles, okay? Uh, they have inguinal nipples. So instead of like on a human where the nipples are on the front on a breast or like a dog where the nipples are, you know, in the line on their stomach, these guys have nipples in the inguinal areas, which means the armpit. So um, like right here, this is where their nipples are going to be like at that joint of your armpit. Um, they have overdeveloped incisors, which are the tusks. On these guys, your incisors are your, not your front two, but the one next to it. Um, so those have actually, like, these are their teeth. Um, this guy has big tusks as well. You just can't see it because this one's a baby, sorry. Um, and then instead of claws, they have those flattened nails. Okay, so kind of like we do. All right. Our next group is the Xenarthra. Uh, I'm going to move me over here. That way we can see. So this is going to include your sloths your anteaters, and your armadillos. Okay, so these guys as a group have extremely slow metabolisms. Um, it's very evident in the sloths who don't move very fast at all. Um, and they have hyper articulation in their joints, which is kind of gross. So think about the way that your wrist can move. Okay, so not only can it go front and back, but it can go side to side and in like a 360 motion, okay? Every joint in their limbs is like that. So they can do this with their elbows, with each of their finger joints, um, with their shoulder joints, their knees, their toes, all of their joints have that hyper articulation. And it's because for the most part, a lot of them are arboreal, okay? Now, down here on the armadillo, he's kind of lost that in his feet um, because he has developed those longer nails so that he's kind of like hoofed instead but his shoulders and elbows are still going to have that hyper articulation um which is disgusting oh and then obviously like this guy right here has this weird face for eating ants ant eaters yeah so, anyways okay so our next group of placental mammals is the gliers boy oh boy this is the biggest group okay so this is going to include all of your rodents and all of your legomorphs um your rabbits and hares and bunnies and things like that this is a huge group Okay, so your gliers are in a group together because they have small, robust bodies. Okay, they pretty much all have the same kind of body. They're going to be really tiny and compact and like ball shaped. Okay, they're going to be chunky. All right, they have quickly growing gnawing teeth. Those front teeth continuously grow throughout their whole life and they gnaw on things. 
Um, they're also highly social. Uh, and so, you know, communication and, you know, social living is a very big part of, you know, their survival. And a lot of them will have cheek pockets, like um, on these guys here and these guys here. Uh, and what's interesting is that, like, hamsters have it. So some of them are actually putting food in their mouth. But a lot of them will have um, kind of like, you know how kangaroos have, like, the belly pocket? A lot of your glears will have an, a, one of those, like, here. Okay, so they can store things in their cheek pocket but it's not actually inside their mouth, which is kind of wild. Um, so your glears are gonna be, you know, all of your rodents, your rats, your mice, all of your squirrels, all of your marmots, your bunnies and rabbits and hares. Um, and it even includes beavers and porcupines. So it's a big group. Okay, our next group is Primatomorpha. And I want to uh, sit on this group for just a little bit because it is the most interesting to me. So your primatomorpha is gonna include your old world and new world monkeys. We'll talk about the difference. And it also includes your apes, okay? So here we have some old world monkeys. The difference between a monkey and an ape is monkeys have tails, okay? And generally monkeys are smaller and not as smart, okay? So here are some old world monkeys. Now within the monkeys, these are the larger. Okay, so these are going to include your, um, your gibbons, your, uh, your macaques, your mandrills, um, and they're called old world monkeys because they live in the old world. So they're like in China, in Asia, um, in Africa, so they live in the old world, okay? Um, and again, because they are monkeys, they have tails, okay? So your new world monkeys are relatively small. Okay, so they're not going to be any bigger than like, I think this guy right here, this um, capuchin monkey is going to be the biggest and he's maybe two feet tall if he stands up real tall. So they're all relatively small. If you want to get into it, this bush baby is going to be like maybe that big. Okay, so they're very tiny. And again, because they are monkeys, they have a tail. Um, and they're called New World monkeys because they live in the New World, which is, you know, the Americas. So... Um, you're going to find these guys in like the jungles of South America. It's a little too cold up in North America. You get some of them in Mexico, I think, but it's a little too cold here in the U.S. So. All right. And then our final group within Primatomorpha is the apes. Okay. Now these guys are all in a group together because they don't have tails. Um, but more than that, they are extraordinarily intelligent. So every type of ape, your gibbon, your chimp, your bonobo, your gorilla, your orangutan, and your human are going to use tools, have language, communicate, have social structures, have politics within the family, like they argue and they have to work it out. Um, they're all very, very intelligent. Yeah, so very social. Um, so you're going to be living in groups of organisms, you know, um, you're going to, you know, Tim the monkey, or, you know, Tim the bonobo made me mad, so, you know, I'm going to be mean to Tim for the next couple of days. Like, very smart, very social. Um, also, relatively larger, okay? So, I think the smallest of these is going to be the gibbon right here, and he's still maybe going to be, like, three or four feet tall if he stands up, um, all the way up to the orangutans and the gorillas, which are probably the largest, um, and again, what unites us all is that we have no tail. So this is the group that we fit in with. Um, we are cousins with these guys. Um, we're basically just like, you know, the, the major difference is that our brains are a lot bigger, like we're a lot smarter and we don't have hair all over our body. So, you know, this is the group that we're in. So we're mammals. More specifically, we are primates. Okay, moving on. Uh, the next group is the Euliptophylla. Uh, this is upsetting. Their name literally means fat and blind, <laughs> which is kind of sad. But this is going to include your moles and your shrews. Um, a lot of times these guys are polydactylous, which you can see here, which means that they have multiple, like more than they're supposed to, fingers on their hands. And a lot of them, like you can see up here, do not have eyes. 
Um, technically, he has them. They are just extremely underdeveloped and covered. Like his eyelids are still fused together because he's underground and he doesn't need it. So a lot of times these guys live underground. They are subterranean, so they have lost the use of their eyes, which again is why he is polydactylous and why his hands are so big and terrifying is because he's digging around a lot. So, ooh, mm, I love bats. Our next group is the bats, the chiropteras. So these are the only mammals that are capable of true flight. You also have like flying squirrels, but they're not actually flying, they're gliding. So these are our only mammals capable of true flight. Um, the wings are their hands, not like birds where the wings are like their arms. In bats, the wings are their hands, okay? And you can see here, oh, hit my computer. Like these are his fingers, okay? So if you look at your hand, like the webbing in between your fingers, like this right here, this is just extended all the way out and that's what he uses to fly. Um, for the most part, they're gonna be using echolocation, which is this down here. They have these big ears and they're gonna squeak and it's gonna bounce and come back and then they're gonna be able to form a 3D picture. Um, but not every one of them will do echolocation. Some of them like fruit bats don't eat bugs, so they just you know, work during the daytime and, or eating fruit. So most of the ones we have here in the US though are going to be nighttime hunters, which means they're using echolocation. And for the most part here in the US, the ones we have are small, like the palm of your hand or smaller. Okay, the ones we have here in Arkansas are gonna be like maybe half the size of the palm of your hand, their body. Now their wings are gonna be bigger, but they're pretty small. Okay, so our next group is the Sertartiodactyla, which is a fun thing to say. Um, these are the even-toed undulates, okay? So if you look here, he's got one, two, three, four, which is an even number, so he is a Sotartiodactyla. Okay, and they have hooves. Uh, a lot of them are gonna have multiple stomachs, okay? So they're gonna have weird digestion. Um, woo, and these are your Sotartiodactylas, okay? So you got camels and llamas and pigs and, you know, cows and deer. Um, sheep, and you also have your whales and your orcas. Now, I know what you're thinking, you're thinking Ms. Altman, these are even toed, these guys don't have feet, they don't even have legs, what are you even talking about? I'm gonna have a whole video about why these guys are in this group because it is a lot to get into, so I'm gonna have another video about that that you can watch if you're curious. Um, I think this is our final group. Oh yeah, it is, because this one creeps me out. Is the Perissodactyla. Um, these are your odd toed undulates. So again, these are hoofed animals, but uh, they only have one or three or five toes. Um, and usually they're only gonna have like one stomach and it's just gonna be a really long digestive system as opposed to cows, which have like four stomachs, okay? Um, and I want to talk for just a second about horses because they're disgusting. So this is what a horse's foot looks like. Um, basically what a horse does is it just spends its whole time standing on point, which is kind of gross because all their toes are fused into that big one long toe. It creeps me out, I don't like it. Okay, so these are your um, even or your odd toed undulates. It's your horses and your donkeys and your zebras. Um, and then over here we have the rhino and the tapir. Um, go Google uh, Zay Frank's video about the tapir, it's wonderful. Oh, and then finally, we have our carnivores, okay? So carnivores are specifically adapted to catching and eating other animals. Um, and because of that, they have these specialized canine teeth, okay? So there's two subgroups of carnivores, and it's basically going to boil down to the dog-like carnivores and the cat-like carnivores, okay? So your dog-like carnivores are in a group together because they are plantigrade, which means that when they walk, they walk on the heels, like they walk on the whole part of their hand, and they are omnivores, which means they can eat meat and vegetables. So these are some examples of dog-like carnivores. Okay, obviously here's your dog. And then here we have our cat-like carnivores. Okay, so these guys are digitigrade, which means when they walk, they walk on their toes. Okay, which makes them really quick and like shifty, okay? <clears throat> now these guys are strict carnivores. That means that they don't get nutrition from vegetables. So you may see your cat eating grass, but it's not 
because he's hungry, it's because he's got a stick stomach, okay? So, they also have retractable claws. Woof, I'm out of time.